Hello and welcome to this week's episode of QTV and boy have we got a fascinating lineup for you today. We'll be taking a look at the Victorian Aid Council's name change to Thorn Harbour Health and meeting with Alison Thorne, one of the early activists honoured in that name change. Michael Whelan from the Down and Dirty Health Project will be giving us a few tips on how to do the beat safely. And we'll be looking at all the fun of the Midsummer Carnival dog show. And finally, we're going to uncover the story of Captain Moonlight and his lover, who was killed in a police shootout many, many years ago. talking uh, with me today, Alison. I'm just going to start, Alison, by asking you what your relationship is to the Solidarity Salon. Well, Solidarity Salon is the home of two socialist feminist organisations, the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women. And I'm a member of both. I've been a, a committed trade unionist all of my life. I've been uh, a union delegate um, all of my life in uh, several um, different unions and I'm a, still a union delegate today. I've committed my life to being a socialist feminist activist but, but interestingly it was but like being involved in the gay liberation movement that was the catalyst for sharpening my understanding of class. Actually, I've probably, given the topic, should highlight um, one more thing. Uh, you asked me about my optimism earlier, Cathy, and um, the Freedom Socialist Party's international newspaper is called The Freedom Socialist. This is the current issue of the newspaper. And um, in it, Dateline Australia is um, looking at the Victorian AIDS Council changing its name to Thorn Harbour Health. Before I ask you about um, Thorn Harbour, I just wanted to hear your thoughts around um, the power of people. The power of people is about um, social change and I like the idea of building on the past, building on the grassroots past in order to build for the future. An organisation has to honour its history, but also look to the the, the, the future. And I thought um, the name did that really, really well. Like having my name linked to with Keith Harbour, um, that was a real honour. Uh, he was somebody who made an enormous difference. An HIV positive person played such a key role within the Victorian AIDS Council, but like myself, also understood the power of people. Like it was really important to see what was happening, not only as a health crisis, but also as a potential political crisis for the LGBTIQ community. This new 
disease that was um, that, like impacting on the gay community, the real political risks that it posed and uh, the importance of being ready um, to address those questions. And like it was around that idea that I um, intervened in the meeting and um, put out the call that it was really important that we, that we get organised. It's something that's uh, documented in the Victorian AIDS Council's history um, under the Red Ribbon. Um, others have written about it as well. So it's, um, it's quite interesting I like I, I wish that uh, every political intervention was as effective and um, well remembered as that one. What a fascinating woman Alison is and what a, a great dedication of her life to the LGBTI community with activism. Absolutely and beautifully understated. Yeah. Such a lovely woman. Marvellous, marvellous. So Tess, what's next? So just a little bit lighter on the lighter side, we're going to take a look now at the Midsummer Carnival Dog Show. Welcome to Midsummer, everyone. How are you feeling? <laughs> I've got my act together and obviously I probably won't get employed next year with an entrance like that. But just so you know, this is the event of Midsummer. I can see so many familiar faces out there, so I'm a little bit too familiar, but at least we are here for a special, special event. You see, Queers around Melbourne. Oh, it's going to go really well. <laughs> OHS. Um, that, that, was a, that was our special effect for, for the drag queen who was going to perform a little bit later. Um, but uh, queers have been pre preparing, they have been training, they have been shampooing, they have been shaving their dogs. And let me tell you, I wish some of them would actually adhere to some of those cleaning regimes themselves. <laughs> Last year, some of those owners were a little bit woof woof, if you know what I mean. A little bit meow meow for those cats in the audience as well. We are here for an absolute phenomenal time. It's the Midsummer Dog Show. Dog. 
rushed to perfection. And our final contestant in the cutest bitch round. No, we have contestant number seven. I'm not sure whether it was more the owners or the dogs that were in protest. I know, I think they strutted themselves on the catwalk. A great piece of entertainment down there in uh -huh. midsummer. Now we're going to be uh, listening to Michael Whelan, who was a recent guest on Saturday Magazine, um, talking about the Sexually Adventurous Men Project, um, yeah. part of Thorn Harbour House Project. Let's take a look. Michael Whelan is a project worker who works on the sexually um, on the ad sexually adventurous sexually men. adventurous men project. I get to uh, liaise with a number of different community groups. They might be into sex on premises venues and uh, outdoor sex and uh, kink and fetish cultures. So Michael, I didn't think there were any beats left in Melbourne. Well, you would think that there there wouldn't be with the you know with all of our clubs and the advent of you know grinder and scruff and all those hookup apps. Um, and th the way that the community has developed since sort of, you know, even the, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, you would think that they would sort of all just die off, but and that is the case for many of them, but some of them are still hot and ready and raring to go. Okay, so um, 
For those of us who thought that Melbourne's beats had gone, <laughs> well, they're apparently still alive. And still alive and kicking. And are there new ones? Have they changed they're the popping location? Up, they're popping up all the time. So there, there are dedicated websites for people that want really? to... Yeah, that want to uh, find a specific locale. So you can find either a toilet block or you might want to go to a park or you might into a certain kind of uh, venue. So rather than just turning up and trying your luck in, in a dark, secluded park at night, you can coordinate yeah. with other other community members and you can discuss what's good and what's bad about that location. So now what we really want to talk about is this violence. Yes. So first of all, tell us about that and then secondly, we really need to have a conversation about what men who are attending these sites should or could do to actually protect themselves and protect their own health and well-being. Yeah, so it, it's it's funny, it is a very subculture, it's a very underground culture. There's a lot of communication that happens within community, so like I said on these websites, and they will let each other know if there's any reports of violence. They'll say, heads up, there was a guy in a suspicious you know, white ute, he was trying to block the entrance to this particular location, or he was shouting violence, or even worse, getting into groups of people and storming parks late at night to try and you know, assault gay men using cheats to, to look for sex. So there have been a few incidences of those, and through those websites, they've been able to get in touch with the SAM project at Thorn Harbour, which is uh, our Down and Dirty project. They've been able to get in touch with us and, and report it through us because they didn't feel comfortable going to the police to report it. Mm -hmm. um, because there is a lot of misinformation around what is and what is not legal when you're trying to look for sex or looking for someone to hook up within a public space. Because there's an interesting discussion, Sam, many years ago, it shows mm. my age, uh, when the first police LGBTI liaison officer was established and there was many meetings and discussions at police headquarters about what constitutes illegal public sex. Yes, and it's um, it, it can be somewhat murky, but there yeah. are some semi-clear guidelines around what is and what is not illegal. So to be in a known beat, not illegal. You can walk around a park cruising for guys all night, for, for every night of the week if, if you would like to. Uh, but if you're, you know, and you can then meet the person and take them home, or you can go to a secluded location, if you, if a person has to take what's called unreasonable steps to view you hooking up, then it's not illegal. So if you were in a closed cubicle door, uh, it was locked, and you were going hell for leather behind the <laughs> behind the cubicle, yeah. you would be not in the public view. The person would have to pretty much climb over or crawl under the cubicle to view. So that would mm. be seen as unreasonable steps. Whereas if you were just walking through the park on a park bench and started getting a little bit frisky with the person you had just met, uh, and you were exposing yourself or exposing them to the wider public and you know yeah. it's a park then that would be illegal let's go back to the conversation sure. around what individual participants can do to look after themselves yeah there's i mean there's lots of different things out there what i would absolutely recommend doing is finding some of these websites because the community is so strong and they really do look after each other so if it's either your first time at a beat or you've been going for years and you have concerns about a specific location you can connect with other beat users and figure out what a safe strategy is um, something I always like to recommend is if you're going out cruising, um, go with a mate. Sen sounds a bit weird, but um, some you know some couples like to go together, or a couple of mates will like to go together and sort of share the experience, but also look after each other. Play Carry still things together. like um, phones or weapons, or what, what's your advice around? Uh, the thing with phones can be tricky. Uh, don't let it distract you too much. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you know, there are a lot of guys that will use. Um, either cruising specific apps or they will use the general dating apps as a way to uh, supplement their cruising behaviour. So they'll go, oh, it looks like there's a few people down there, I'll go for a walk around. Oh. So they'll then communicate, hey, would you maybe like to come and meet well, me in such and such a place? Well, I was phone to call, dial people zero. Exactly, and that's the other thing. So if you do need to... <laughs> I got it wrong. If you, do need, if you do need to exit the situation with relative expediency, you can <coughs> get to a safe place and then call triple zero. Um, or you can call a friend, or if you know if you've got someone nearby. Uh, the other thing I would recommend is don't walk around with your headphones in. It can make you look really casual. Like, you know, if you're particularly aware of police in the area and you're wondering maybe if they think, if you think that you're going to be busted for cruising, which you won't be, uh, it can make you look like, oh no, I'm just listening to music. But it will distract you, and you can't. Yeah. You're not familiar with your surroundings and that sort of thing. On. So phones, I wouldn't necessarily recommend leave at home. But you know, things like your wallet and stuff, if you're worried about not just violence, but uh, assaults where theft might be involved, then leaving those things behind is fantastic too. Now you know what's going to happen. I can't wait to go and have a look. <laughs> Tass, Tass, is going to, uh, Tass is going to do some geographical research and some... Uh, oh no, I'm going to this um, downright and dirty website. Yes, yeah. it's really cool. Wasn't well, it interesting to find out what actually constitutes illegal public sex? 
It was, and I thought it was a very engaging interview with lots of lots of probing questions. <laughs> <laughs> but finally, tonight we're going to end on a, a beautiful love story about Captain Moonlight and his lover, who was tragically shot in a police shootout um, many, many moons ago. So let's take a look at this. Andrew George Scott, better known to history as the Bush Ranger Captain Moonlight, is not much better known to history as that. He was not one of the A-list Bush Rangers. He's of interest to us mostly because of his romantic attachment to his young companion, James Nesbitt. Scott and Nesbitt met here at Kentridge Jail in the 1870s when they were both serving time, and they clearly became quite attached to each other. Scott decided that bush ranging was the life for him, and Nesbitt decided to join him, along with two other young men that they knew. This was not a glorious success. Within a couple of months, they had made their way to New South Wales, but they were broke, they were hungry, and they were desperate. They came eventually to a station called Wantabadgery, and here, inevitably, the police caught up with them, and there was a shootout. It was a disaster for the bush rangers. And in the end, Nesbitt was killed. The remarkable thing is that as newspaper reports said at the time, he wept like a child, laid his head upon his breast and kissed him passionately. Moonlight survived the shootout, but he was arrested, charged, convicted and condemned to death. He spent his last days in prison in Sydney, wearing a lock of Nesbitt's hair as a ring around his finger and writing letters to family and friends and supporters in which he discussed, amongst other things, his attachment to Nesbitt, describing him, My own dearest Jim, we were united in every tie that could bind human friendship. We were one in hopes, one in heart and soul, and this unity lasted till he died in my arms. Far from fearing his imminent execution, Moonlight seemed to look forward to it. I long to join him where there shall be no more parting. Moonlight pleaded with the authorities to let him be buried with his young friend, writing to them, uh, expressing that wish, and designing a headstone for their common grave, which he wanted inscribed, This stone covers the remains of two friends. The authorities, of course, were having none of that, and the two of them were in fact buried in separate cemeteries, separated by hundreds of miles. That is, until 1995, when a group of Moonlight enthusiasts set out and succeeded in persuading the authorities to allow them to disinter Scott, Captain Moonlight, and to rebury him at Gundagai North Cemetery, which was where Nesbitt was buried. I found that fascinating. You know, the duality of the man, he, on the one hand, could be so ready to tout the law and, and probably be quite violent and yet on the other hand be so soft and in love with his partner. Just shows everyone's got a couple of signs to them, Tess. Absolutely. So that's a wrap for us this week. We had a great interview with Alison Thorne from Thorne Harbour Health, a quick peek at the dog show down at the Midsummer Carnival, uh, a chat to Michael Whelan about doing the beat safely, and finally a lovely story about Captain Moonlight and his lover. But come back next week, we've got more great stories for you on QTV. Good night.